Hello, everyone. Um, I have five o'clock um, right on the dot Eastern time, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I am Eileen Thrower. I am the department chair for the Department of Midwifery and Women's Health, and um, really excited that you've joined us this evening. Great to see a few of you with your cameras on, but I'm glad that you can all be here. And I have a couple other people on the call. I would like to introduce themselves. Um, Eva, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Eva Freed. I'm the clinical director for the Department of Midwifery and Women's Health, and I will be one of the people doing our best to keep up with the chat. So if it's something that's going to come up later, we'll just tell you. Hope we'll get to that later, but don't be shy to post things that you have in the chat as we go. I'm glad you're all here. And then Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Dr. Thrower. Hi, I'm Stephanie Boyd. I'm the Director of Clinical Outreach and Placement here at Frontier. So my team are uh, my team it includes the clinical advisors who will be helping you identify appropriate uh, sites and preceptors as you work to develop your clinical plan if you become a student here at Frontier, which we hope you do. All right, thank you, um, Eva and Stephanie. And I assume you could all see my, the slides okay, correct? Okay, yes. all right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so at, at Frontier, our mission, as you can see on the slide, and I don't need to read it to you, but our mission is really one that focuses on educating nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner students um, with a special focus on rural and underserved areas. Um, and this is really important for us. We also um, really value um, work that is going on at the institution and that we're all doing individually and as a, as a, and as a community um, to really ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion in everything that we do. Um, and I share this, I, we like to start with this slide because it really um, does drive everything that we do at Frontier. And I think that um, if you have friends or um, coworkers or acquaintances that are Frontier students or alumni, um, I think many of them will share with you that we really do have this, um, this culture of caring that I think we'll talk about a little bit more in later on. One of, in the picture here is one of our circle ups, and it's one of the things that we really love at Frontier is to just get in a circle and reflect on our time together as um, as our days come to a conclusion. Um, so, and I am so sorry, y'all. I have a dog that is not happy right this minute, so please forgive me. Um, Eva, do you mind doing a slide or two and let me go see if I can deal with that? Yes, you own them. So you need to advance them unless you make me the co-host before you go deal with your pup. Um, well, he's, he'll just take me a minute. Okay. All right. Oh, I can talk. I'm good. I like talking. So <laughs> as Dr. Thrower said, we do, um, focus first and foremost on a culture of caring. So yes, um, people who attend school at Frontier are graduate students, and we have high expectations, and graduate school is inherently challenging, and that all takes place within a culture of caring that we are committed to in terms of how we engage with one another as faculty and staff, and also how we engage with students and preceptors. Um, I'll go ahead and take the rest of this slide, Dr. Thrower, since I started talking. And your community is your main classroom. So most of you already know that you're here listening to this because you're interested in distance education. So you will be part of the frontier community and be part of the circle ups and part of learning in our campus community by coming to something called frontier bound before you even start your first courses. And then you'll come back to campus again um, before you begin clinicals. But all of your coursework happens from your home community, and then your clinicals happen either from your home community or from a different community that you choose to go to um, in order to do the clinical part of your education. And our campus that I referred to is in Versailles, Kentucky, which is Northern Kentucky. And that's everything on this slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so, an one of the things that we are very excited about at Frontier is our is the depth of our faculty. We have um, the largest nurse midwifery education program in the country, and because of that, it takes a lot of faculty to um, keep everything running. But that really, I think, for our students, gives an opportunity to. Um, 
really interact with people that have done mid lots of different held lots of different roles in midwifery, had lots of different special interests. And I think a lot of our students really enjoy the fact that they um, they come in, many of our students come in with very particular interests in mind and almost always find a faculty member that shares that interest and has experience in that. Um, so we have lots of um, faculty. We have um, lots of, we have students in every state in the country and alumni in every, not only every state, but around the, around the planet, really. Um, we currently have about 2,500 currently, currently enrolled students and about 8,000, over 8,000 graduates at this point in time. So as Eva mentioned, she kind of referred to the Frontier community and it seems a little counterintuitive since it's a distance education program, but I do think that the Frontier experience is very unique in that we really have a Frontier community that is, um, as I said, not just nationwide, but really international at this point. And I think that's a really important um, advantage that Frontier offers, because even though you're at home and it feels like that might be very isolating, um, really, I think most of our students feel very connected to other students, to faculty and our staff. And in fact, I've had, it's a very common comment that I hear that people feel more supported and more connected than they have previously in programs that are um, brick and mortar where they were physically going to campus every day. And I think the explanation for that is that at Frontier, we know that we're distance, we know that we're all far apart. And so it's very intentional for us to really make those community ties and connections, even across states and, and countries. Um, we've also, other achievements that we're proud of are on the screen. We um, have received this International Distance Learning Award, and then also a number of years in a row, I now top colleges for diversity. Diversity, equity, inclusion work is very important to us at Frontier. Um, we know in the past that hasn't always been the case for many academic institutions, and Frontier is, is no exception, but at this point in time, it's part of our um, mission statement, it's part of our guiding principles that really, um, that we really try to pursue and work on every single day. So, um, one of the ways that you're going to feel that our students feel very connected and very supported um, is through the, like I already mentioned through faculty, but also through some really important staff members. And that is, um, and Stephanie Boyd is here with us tonight. Thanks. And she introduced herself earlier. But we, you really, our students have a whole team of people that are with them throughout their journey at Frontier while they are in their earlier parts of the program and the didactic. Phase. You're obviously working very closely with your faculty, but also from the very beginning, you begin to work with Stephanie and her team of um, clinical advisors to as you're trying to as you're identifying clinical sites and preceptors. Um, we have an amazing group of academic advisors that um, do the thing that you might think about, which is help you decide what courses to take in what term. But they have a lot more important roles that a lot of other roles that are really important. They're an enormous support of support for source of support for our students in terms of um, tools in their toolkit that can help you help our students with studying, with um, resume building, all sorts of things. We have um, we have quite a few student groups that are um, part of our community. We have some special interest groups that reach out to um, people that have. Um, particular interests and um, commonalities. We also um, have amazing financial aid and scholarships. I I can't quote the number right off the top of my head, but the, the amount of scholarships that we award every year is really significant. It's a large amount of money that's available. And then um, another interesting thing that always seems a little counter counterintuitive to me is that we have an amazing library. If you went to our physical library in Versailles, you would think, okay, well, I have this, this many books at my house, uh, but what we have an enormous um, depth of is our, uh, our digital library. Um, really all, we have an enormous access to lots of diverse journals, lots of electronic books. So that's really helpful. Um, we also have a 
a really thriving and active um, diversity and inclusion department that hosts for us every year a diversity impact program. And that's coming up um, in early June, so next month. Um, so there are lots of supports that I think our students can take advantage of. One that's on this, not on this slide, but is really valuable to our students is we have a relationship with um, a counseling service that will actually, um, and that actually makes, we make appointments with those counseling services available to our students at no charge to them. So our commitment at Frontier, as we already said, is to our mission. It's to that culture of caring. And one of the most important ways that we believe that plays out is in student support. Eva, I'm going to turn it back over to you one more time. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, is this one for me or is this for staff? I can, oh, all right. She's got to go deal with doggy. Okay. <laughs> um, you're good for me to keep going with this one? Okay. So there are scholarships available. Some of you might be wondering, it's hard to know with graduate school, sort of how am I going to pay for this? What's available to me? So there are scholarships available. Um, there's two award cycles during the year. We do have admissions for four terms per year. Um, and we award scholarships in two of those terms, spring and fall. It doesn't mean if you start a different term, you wouldn't be eligible for awards. It just means we don't give awards um, initiating those other terms. Um, and because in order to get those scholarships, you already have to have at least 24 credits that you've earned in the program. So you can't get them necessarily right off the bat. Um, and you need to demonstrate minimum grade point average of 3.25. And there are 20 different scholarships available. Um, let's see if she's going to advance us. She's back. Perfect. <laughs> and I think this one would be a great one for Stephanie. Thanks. So I've exiled my dog to the bedroom and I'm hoping <laughs> we're going to hear of him. So I, all good. <laughs> Stephanie, do you want to give us a little more details about our clinical outreach and placement services? Sure. Thanks. So um, as we said earlier, part of our department includes three clinical advisors and those three staff members work directly with you from the time that you come to orientation at Frontier Bound. Uh, you meet them there. And then once you return home and start your didactic coursework, they're available to you in a variety of ways. They do group clinical uh, advising sessions and individual sessions. Uh, for, for any student who would like support. Some of our students, probably about a third, come in knowing where they would like to, to um, complete their clinical rotations. We have about a third who kind of have an idea, but maybe don't have a solid yes from a preceptor or a site yet. And then we have a third of students that come in and aren't quite sure where they're going to rotate or don't have a plan yet for various reasons. Um, and all of those things are okay. We're prepared to help students across that spectrum, no matter where they're at. Um, because once you get that yes, and even before that, we're working with you to make sure that you have lots of documentation submitted to our credentialing department so that they can make sure that um, you're all ready from a legal standpoint to walk into that clinical site your first day of clinical. So we're able to do um, a lot of those things up front to help you. We don't want you to get lost and worry about paperwork and all that good kind of stuff. So we help you with that. We provide resources to you to be able to uh, identify potential sites and preceptors once you're a student, you're able to access a clinical database. We like to call it our community map. And uh, from that database, you're able to see uh, sites and preceptors all over the United States who have worked with us in the past or are currently working with us and that we're contracted with. And those pool of preceptors and sites are there for you to be able to look at and potentially capture as part of your clinical plan. Um, and our we work with you up until the time that you go to clinical bound when you will be uh, ready to kind of be turned over to your regional clinical fac faculty member. And uh, that's your support person and your clinical expert when you're in your clinical rotation. So we're here to help you before clinical bound. Um, I see a question about, are you able to complete rotations in US territories? And currently at this time, you're not able to do that. Um, and do you have a list of sites that would precept FNU midwifery students? We do actually, um, and you're able to really use that community map to filter out uh, by geography, by uh, whether it's a, you know, a hospital, which is the, where the majority of your encounters would be as, as a midwifery student, but also out of hospital experience at a birth center or home birth site. 
So um, our clinical advisors will work to kind of help you match up what your needs and uh, uh, um, opportunities are with those sites that we have contracts with. So that's the bulk of what we do. Uh, Caitlin Rivard is on the call tonight. She's one of our newer clinical advisors and she works with students all day long, uh, getting on calls with them to help look through that community map and identify potential sites and preceptors. So that's what we love to do. Um, it can be overwhelming. We know as a graduate student to walk into this program and be focusing on becoming maybe an online student, you know, in, a, in an online environment and maybe a graduate student for the first time. And so um, this whole clinical uh, site selection process can feel overwhelming. So we're here to just support you and make it as easy and hopefully as uh, less stressful as we can. Um, we know that we can't take all the stress away because this is your plan is it, and it's exciting, but you know, you're worried. So hopefully if you meet with us, you'll be able to feel a lot better about um, your clinical plan, kind of what you're doing and what everything's going to look like when you're ready to go to clinical. It's a fun, it's a fun time to think about all the possibilities with you all. I see a couple of questions over there and maybe we'll save those for the end, but um, we'll try to answer some of these in the chat. I see Caitlin is answering questions. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so on this slide, there's some pictures of some of our uh, some of the other team members that our students encounter. Um, you've already met Dr. Fried and myself, and all of our, our courses. Um, in in each one of our courses, we have a course coordinator who's kind of the lead faculty, and then other multiple course faculty faculty within the course. Um, so. Really what that means for our students is that sometimes we have um, classes that are fairly large. They might be 200 plus um, students in there. However, um, we have the advantage of never having to sit in that auditorium, right? Since we're all at home in our, um, in our own homes and communities. And um, because we have faculty that are assigned to a smaller group of students, the experience is never of being in that huge course. It's usually an experience of more like being in a course with 20 to 30 students, because that's kind of the number that you're, the, a faculty member would be um, responsible for. I think that really ends up um, helping give you support and guidance along the way. Um, we also have something that we call a regional clinical faculty, and you'll hear us talk about them at Frontier as the RCF, and those are faculty members. So they're either nurse midwives and or nurse practitioners that work with our students once they get to the clinical part of the program. Um, and, and I think we'll go over this a little bit more in, in a minute, but at Frontier, we have all of our academic or didactic courses are front loaded. So you do all of those first. And then you come onto campus, as Eva mentioned, for that clinical bound experience, um, where you start getting um, some opportunities to practice in a very safe environment with um, practicing hand skills and history taking and the, cl the clinical management process, all of those types of things. Once you finish clinical bound, then you go out and do your clinicals. And at that point, your clinical faculty member works with you um, very closely all throughout that experience. We've kind of already talked about some of these other folks. I know we mentioned our credentialing um, department. Um, once you identify a site and a preceptor that has agreed to work with you, we have a whole department of folks that set up those the legal side of things and do those contracts. So that part um, is not on our students at all. That is really, um, we have folks that will help with that. On an occasional basis, they'll ask you to do a, a little bit of footwork maybe, but for the most part, they take care of all of the credentialing and the legal aspect of things. Um, so for many of us that are ha that have this goal of becoming a nurse midwife or a nurse practitioner, um, you kind of think, that it's going to look like the picture at the top, right? Okay, this is what I want to do, so I'm just going to go do it. But as we know, the universe has other plans for us. Sometimes, oh, I don't know, a whole entire global pandemic takes place. But other times, it's just, you know, there are lots of things that come up in life. Um, so we're excited that you're here today. And um, we're excited that um, even though the bottom picture may be more realistic, it 
your being here today really represents another step in that journey. Um, so a couple of degree options, as you'll be aware, um, most of our APRN programs, the Nurse Midwifery Program and our WHNP program, um, you can do those, you can come in with a BSN, excuse me. <laughs> so if you come in with a BSN, you would be in our master's program and you would end up with a master's of science in nursing. For students that are already advanced practice nurses that are considering maybe coming back to add nurse midwifery or add the WHNP, those students already have an MSN and so they would come in as a postgraduate certificate student and they wouldn't end up doing all of the, um, they don't have to repeat some of the core competencies that they've re already learned, but we'll focus more on the management side of things. And then of course we also offer a doctor of nursing practice program and you can um, move fairly easily from our master's program into the doctorate program, but, but all of our programs do stop out of the master's and then you would need to reapply if you wanna keep going or let us know that that's your plan. Our um, programs operate on a term system and we have four terms per year. So um, right now, folks that are applying would be applying still, I believe for a summer start because you no, know, for a fall, are we still at summer? Yeah, we're still at summer, right? I think the deadline for that is the early June. Are you look, I, I see Stephanie looking it up. So we'll get, she can come back to us on that. Um, but our, so our terms are 11 weeks long and then there's a break between terms of two weeks and then we start over. Um, so what the advantage that that offers for our students is that for one, as you're thinking about potentially applying, we have four application times per year. So we admit students four times a year. That works on a rolling um, admission process. So once you apply, typically it's just a number of weeks, maybe two to four weeks before most people get a decision. Um, it also, the nice thing at our um, institution is that every course that we offer is offered every single term. So there's no waiting until a course that you need is available. It's, they're all, they all, they all come around every term. Um, our MSN program takes about two and a half years, two and a, um, if you do it at a pretty steady pace, if you stretch it out, it can go up to three years. And there's a little bit of flexibility there at the um, MSN level. We always recommend um, trying to take a deep breath and take time to learn the material rather than trying to rush through it. So I would generally say to count on two and a half to three years for the MSN program. And then about a, a year and a half for the midwifery postgraduate certificate program, maybe a little bit shorter for the WHNP, but about a year and a half. Um, and then the DNP program, can be done in about 18 months. All right, Eva, do you wanna pick back up and? I do. Perfect. So, yeah, so um, you do need to have a current RN license. And one thing that's different um, at Frontier from some of the other um, midwifery and nurse practitioner programs is you can have a bachelor's degree in any field as long as you also have an RN license. So for example, when I got my nursing degree, I had a bachelor's in women's and gender studies. So I didn't actually earn a BSN. Um, so you have to be able to be, you know, uh, work as a nurse in the US and also have a bachelor's degree in any field. Um, you need to have a minimum of a 3.0 in that nursing degree. Um, you do need one year of RN experience. Um, it's great if that experience is related to the track that you are um, exploring. If it's not, and you have other work experience that's related to that track, we are open to hearing about that. Um, we do require that everybody um, be vaccinated against COVID-19, and that's um, for a variety of reasons, but we require vaccination to keep our campus as safe as possible, and it's also exceedingly difficult to identify clinical sites, particularly inside hospitals if you're not vaccinated. And then we have some pretty specific limitations on how many students can um, be in clinical in New York, 
and that's a, a New York special situation, um, but we do accept students in all 50 states. We just have some limits in the New York state. And um, so the PGC program, that is what Dr. Thor was just talking about, the postgraduate certificate. So that's if you already are an advanced practice nurse with one specialty and you're coming back for a different specialty than we offer. So you need to have um, the current RN license, also have the master's or higher degree in nursing in an advanced practice nursing specialty. So you can't be like a master's in nurse education or something like that. You have to be an APRN to come back. Um, as a PGC student, and um, the same vaccination and New York situations apply. Um, so if you come from one of these specialties, then you're eligible to apply to one of the specialties that we offer. And if you're here tonight, that's probably because you're interested in midwifery or WHNP. And we do take a look at what you've accomplished in your first um, journey to advanced practice nursing and make some modifications if that's appropriate um, in terms of the courses and the clinical experiences that you need. And it's fun to meet people from all over the country and sometimes uh, living abroad during their didactic um, courses that are on the same journey as you and have similar values and similar goals. So that's exciting. And I'll turn the application deadline info over to somebody else. All right, so there it is. I didn't have to try to think about it. Um, so June the 28th is the deadline to apply for the fall term and coursework would begin on October the 9th for that application cycle. And then September the 27th would be the deadline to apply for a winter start, which would be which would begin January the 8th. So those are the deadlines. If you go to Frontier, um, to the to our Frontier website, which is just frontier.edu, um, you'll find the application um, process all kind of delineated there for you. And that's where the application is. It is all done on, um, online. It does require um, writing some short essays and uh, getting copies of your transcripts from other programs that you've completed. Um, you'll have to turn a, a copy of your resume. And for those students that um, Eva mentioned earlier that um, have a bachelor's degree in something other than nursing, there's um, some additional short answer questions that, that are required to answer. Um, you see the tuition there at the bottom, it's 600 $46 per credit hour. And so um, it, really that at the end of the program equates to Frontier being comparing, being very competitive with other programs in terms of cost. One, one of the more reasonable programs that are is available in the country. All right, Eva, I think this one's back to you. If you- are I love it. No, I love talking about our clinical experience. I just had to unmute. Um, okay, so our master's students need 675 clinical hours, which is a minimum. And also um, you can't squish that into any fewer than 16 weeks of clinical. And for, I honestly can't think of anybody who's done it in 16 weeks. That's pretty unrealistic. And most people do over 675 because for either program, um, midwifery or women's health, you need to achieve the number of visit types that we've set forward as a basic minimum. And you need to um, have your regional clinical faculty and your primary preceptor agree that you're ready for safe beginning practice. And it's not that that necessarily takes more than 675 hours. It's that to put all those pieces together and actually have access to those experiences in a meaningful way, um, it is plausible that it takes more than 675 hours. It definitely takes more than, six, than 16 weeks to integrate it um, because your brain has to actually process the things that you're learning. Um, so 675 hours is the minimum hours you have to be there, but for most people, it does realistically take more than that, just to be honest. And then for PGC, um, you you don't take one particular um, clinical component. So that leaves you with a total of 540 hours that needs to be completed in a minimum of 14 weeks. And then you can see what the DNP requirements are 
And then visit types are required actually for both midwifery and WHNP. So I'm not sure why I decided to leave it here under midwifery. So anyway, always something to learn and do better on. Um, but what is special with midwifery is that it's competency-based. So in midwifery, you really um, specifically need to demonstrate competency in all of those visit type areas. And it does typically take more time in midwifery because you can't control when labors and births are going to happen. You could show up every single day at the hospital and labors and births might not happen. So um, your clinical advisor and your regional clinical faculty will work with you on exactly what that looks like. It's not something that just goes on and on forever, but once you have a sense of where you might be attending clinical, we can help you get a sense of what that looks like for you in terms of being able to still work and family responsibilities and that type of thing while you're completing school. Hey, we want to answer questions because several of us on this call have this awesome, wonderful job that we love and are here to usher you into if that's also what you love. So, um, and also we didn't catch this and say, or women's health NP. I don't know. I'm a women's health. I think I'm a women's health NP and a nurse midwife. So I just read these slides all the time and that's what it said to me, but um, we're happy to answer all your questions. All right. I think I'll stop sharing so we can do that. Um... And so we can go through the chat box, but also, okay, so somebody on the iPhone, on a phone with a question, go ahead if you want, would like, you can just speak up. And then um, it looks like we've answered a lot of the questions in the chat box. If you have a question in the chat box that hasn't been answered, please feel free to turn on your mic and just um, ask. Well, I think we definitely want to speak to Natalie's question. What are working hours like as a midwife? <laughs> I'll take that because I do the transition to clinical orientation um, session when you're ready to um, cross that bridge from your didactic work to your clinical work. And one of the faculty on my team um, made the slide about the working hours and it says newsflash <laughs> because the working hours are notoriously challenging um, for nurse midwives. And Ryan, I'm very excited about your question and happy to answer that. I'll circle back to that in just a minute. Um, so the working hours for nurse midwives um, are often more than 40 hours a week. Um, depend there is a move towards more um, 12 hour shifts. If you're at a busy enough practice, that you can split it with your practice partners and do you know, eight hour days in the office and cover 12 hour shifts at the hospital. There is more of a move in that direction, but lots of midwives still cover a lot of call time where they may or may not work, but can't, may, not, may or may not end up working depending on who's in labor or giving birth, but at the same time, can't do other things like go out of town or go to a movie with their family and only take one car. So it is definitely a big lifestyle commitment. It's also something to think about with, you know, all of you are nurses. So how you feel about weekends, holidays, missing trick or treat. Um, I think it's a really important thing to be thinking about. It's an incredibly re rewarding career and it does take a toll on your body to be, you know, so physically engaged with your work and um, stay up at night. Um, and it is definitely a juggle. So that is worth considering, um, when you're thinking about, you know, kind of what's best for you to invest in. Um, I'll take a couple more questions, Dr. Thrower, and then turn it over to you. Um, so gender inclusive care is covered in both programs. And I will say that at this particular moment in time, a distinction between the two programs is that the professional organizations that oversee the core competencies for each degree, the professional organization that creates those for the WHNP role has been much more proactive in being inclusive of gender affirming care um, than the professional organization for midwives. I do see that coming down the pike and certainly um, a significant number of um, practicing nurse midwives and nurse midwifery educators are agitating in that direction. And it is not as clearly a requirement of the core competencies, which makes it challenging, even though it's within our mission and vision, to um, charge people money for credit hours for content that isn't required. So I do see us heading in that direction, though. Um, and I do, I'm not able to speak to the FNP reproductive health program because I don't teach in that program. Um, all right, I'll stop talking for a second and turn it over to you, Dr. Thrower. Well, um, 
Would you like to address the working, doing clinicals where you work question first? Oh, sure. Um, a couple I of folks that. have been asking about that. Okay. Oh, I didn't even scroll down past the ones I knew I had stopped at. So I'll say one thing first. I'm skipping over Audrey's. I haven't even read it yet. Um, and I'm going to fav blessed. Um, yes. Okay. Somebody already answered that. Okay. The sites where you work. So, um, we do not allow students to work on a labor and birth unit and attend births as a student nurse midwife on that same unit. What we do allow is for you to take a leave of absence from that unit um, and maybe use your paid time off, go to mother infant. If you're at a hospital that doesn't just have LDRPs, go to anapartum. You can go to another unit or take a break from a unit that you work on during the didactic portion, but while you're in clinical, you don't also work there. And then um, it's typically not an issue if you're an office nurse. Um, it's not quite as complicated, but it is still something that um, if you are thinking that there's any potential overlap that you work in that system or you're going to work in that site or a related site, we do ask that you are forthcoming about that um, when you first enroll with your regional clinical faculty person. And that person and I will work with you to um, help you take advantage of any particular option you've been offered in terms of precepting. That's not uncommon that you're a labor and birth nurse and somebody's like, you're so great. Why don't you go to midwifery school? We'll precept you. Um, so we know that that's a thing that happens and we're often able to help you figure out a way to still earn money, um, precept with the people who've offered that to you and also be in compliance with our requirements. All right, thank you, Eva. Um, Shanna, are you typing your question out or you wanna just speak up and tell and ask it? Um, you're muted. Can you unmute? Oh, there you go. Not muted. Um, yeah, sorry, I was typing it out. My question is as far as admissions. So I'm finishing up my, um, my BSN now and I'll be done fall of 2023. And so for the the, the course beginning January 18th, um, since I won't technically have graduated yet, can I still apply so that I can just not miss a semester and just go right in? And hey, Shana, you, go I ahead. I can answer that. Yep, I'm here from admissions. I'm Bobby, I'm an admissions counselor. Um, so in order to apply and actually be submitted for review, we do need to have official transcripts with that conferral date and that cumulative GPA. So you would need to finish the program that you're in first um, in order to apply. You could start the application process early, um, but then we but we wouldn't be able to actually submit you for review um, until we have those official final transcripts. So what month did you say you finished that? Um, well, it's fall of 2023, so it's probably whenever before winter break is. So, um, yeah, so you, you would want to, you could apply once, um, once you finish that we would be, if it was like around like end of 2023, we would be in the application cycle for the spring term at that time, which would start in April. April. I don't think we have that date yet. I've been keeping an eye on it on the website and I haven't seen the official date um, for April yet. So I don't think we have that one yet. Okay. And then Shanna, you already have nursing experience working as a nurse. You're just finishing your BSN. Well, I was a CPM for many years. Oh, okay. Back to nursing school, did nursing school. Then I'm back with my practice doing home births and finishing up my BSN. So okay. like, yeah, it's been a, it's been a while. Okay. That sounds like a plan then. Perfect. Yeah. So, you know, it's hard because like, you know, I have a pretty high GPA and I'm like steadily working. I'm also like not so young. So I'm trying to, trying to get it all in fast. Um, so it's hard to think about missing that whole. Yeah. Yeah. Down. Okay. Um, so a couple of other questions. Um, I saw a question about is the October start, is that open still to, for applications? And the answer is yes. Thank you, Bobby. And that deadline to apply is June 28th for an October start. So you um, still have a little, almost two months to work that you could be working on that. Um, so the question is, which, uh, okay, Eva, you already answered that, which is more competitive 
WHMP or CNM, and I was going to say the exact same thing. Setting has an awful lot to do with it. And if you look at the country nationally, there are an, about a, a very similar number of nurse midwives in the country as there are WHMPs. Um, and so that makes lends me to think that the job opportunities are fairly equal, but there can be a lot of variation on that based on where you live. So part of that, um, and that's one of the things that we do early on in our curriculum is actually have folks look at their nurse practice act and look at um, those kinds of things. So we kind of do help you guide you in that direction, but those are also good things to be thinking about even as you are um, considering applying. Um, can you can you clarify more about like where we live and how it's like the job market different between those two in like how how the how the area where we live of can have a influence on like yes. the job market yes. between those two? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it um it kind of varies. First of all, it can vary state by state based on the way um, advanced practice nurses are regulated. There are some states where um, that don't recognize WHMPs, although that's very unusual, but there are other states where there are very, very few nurse midwives or midwives working. So some of that is based on the Nurse Practice Act that legislates the regulation of those advanced practice nurses. And then some of it just depends on um, things more like whether you're in a very rural setting or if you're in a large metropolitan area. Um, you know, if you're I live in Georgia, so, you know, I can tell you that if you were in the Atlanta area, you in every specialty um, would have lots of job options. If you are in a much more rural area, um, it's really going to just depend on the community. And so it's hard to give an answer that's going to fit every community. But I think it does. One approach would be to try to make some connections in your community you may, which you may already have in place if you're working as a nurse. Um, you may think about joining groups like A1, um, and then just kind of. You may also just, you know, open up your web browser and Google how many nurse midwives or how many WHMPs are are working in your area. That's probably kind of the direction I would go. Um, Audrey, did you have a question? Hi. Yeah. Um, I guess it's kind of like specific but you you all said um for experience having like at least a year within the field and so I've been a nurse for three years but I am transitioning into labor and delivery but we'll probably only have about six months of experience whenever I'm applying does that like does that to be considered do I need to have about a year in okay. no it's actually not required at all to have labor and delivery experience that's required to have a year of nursing experience okay. You had said a year in like in a related yeah. field. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> and you know, the thing about that is we, really about a third of our midwifery students do not have experience working as an RN in a labor and birth unit anywhere. Um, so it's very much um, acceptable to come without any experience in, in a particular in that particular role. I really believe and I really find that no matter what your nursing experience is, you're going to bring um, incredible, all those things really benefit you. So, you know, we'll have folks come in that are, you know, they've been working in the neuro ICU and they come to do midwifery and, and they're thinking, well, that's really not going to be helpful. Turns out at the end of the day, um, pregnant people also have <laughs> nervous systems and much to my chagrin as a midwife end up having things like strokes and seizures. So all it, nursing experience is really relevant and a really valuable, well, however that looks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I am sorry I don't see your name, but on the iPhone. Hello, everyone. Hi. I am, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can Dr. hear you. Eva and Dr. Eli. Yeah, I'm a four-year nurse but I have recently passed the in-class exam. So also I have also practiced midwifery in my country, but I'm, my husband is a US citizen and plan to move to Minnesota in 
this year. So I'm thinking about if I, I what I researched is like Frontier has a, the deductive courses to be taken in your home community. So am I eligible to take the deductive courses before I move to the US or it is necessary to move to the US first, then start midwifery course? You can absolutely do those didactic courses basically anywhere on the planet that has a good internet connection. Um, you do most of our courses, and I think I saw this question earlier in the chat box, our courses are set up to be asynchronous. So in other words, they're set up for you to do them on your time schedule. We do not have a single course in our program where you're required to be online, for instance, every Tuesday and Thursday at any particular time. However, we have threaded throughout our curriculum, we have um, experiences that are synchronous. So in other words, we commonly have um, simulated patient visits in our courses, and you have to sign up for those at a particular time. So in answer to your question, the main thing to keep in mind is the time zone difference. And if there's a, if you're doing a, a simulated learning experience, you might be doing it where you live at a really unusual hour, but you can make that work um, as long as you kind of know that ahead of time and, and kind of go in with your eyes wide open on that, that can work out fine. What you do, what is required is that our, once you get to the clinical part of the program, you do have to be in this, one of the 50 U United States to do clinicals. Does that help? Yes, perfect. All right, great. Thank you. You're welcome, yeah. Melanie. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I feel like I have a bajillion of questions going through my brain right now, so I'm just going to try and pinpoint. One thing that I was concerned about was the um, prerequisite coursework. Um, I believe I, I noticed that we would need to have a health assessment course completed if it wasn't specifically listed in our nursing curriculum. Is that the case as well for, um, I think it was mentioned, advanced uh, physical pharmacological and pathophysiology across the lifespan, is that the same for that as well? No, for our MSN students, the only thing that's required is that that individual health assessment course, you know, as a prior course. But if you don't have it, we have that course available. You just take end up taking that first. All okay. of our MSN students take our pathophysiology course, our pharmacology course, and our advanced physical assessment. Um, postgraduate students would have already had those. And if they're less than 10 years old, then they it's generally not required to take them again. But we would look at that and help kind of make that determination as part of the application process. Understood. Thank you. And if um if we wanted to get that health assessment course completed before to not have to add it onto our the beginning of our curriculum, is that a is that a possibility or something you recommend? Like at another institution? Um, that could be a possibility, although we definitely have it set up at Frontier where you can take that as one of the, the first courses that you take, and it ends up working quite seamlessly. Okay. Um, at Frontier, I don't believe you can take that as a non-matriculating student. I don't know if anybody, re uh, Bobby or Stephanie, does that, I think that if you come to us and you don't have that physical assessment course, that's going to be added to your program of study. It's that uh, one single course that you would start off with at the beginning. Understood, thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Any, was that, any other questions, Melanie, or was that it? Uh, actually, I do. Um, if, okay, if that's go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, so I also noticed that we had a uh, tech certification. I think it's called Bay Bayonet Tree or Bayon Tree 101. Yeah. Banyan Tree, that's right. Something. Mm -hmm. um, is that something we need to have done before we begin our courses or? No, that's something that you would get at. Well, that's something that you get access to once you are admitted and you do do that before you, before you come to that um, orientation, that on-campus orientation session that Dr. Fried referred to earlier, um, that Frontier Bound, you would have all of that done before you come to Frontier Bound. And it really kind of provides that foundational orient orientation to the curriculum. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Um, 
have one more okay. <laughs> question. Um, I noticed um, one of the clinical um, visits that we would have to um, Kentucky uh, had room and board and the other one didn't. I was just wondering if both of them included room and board with the cost. Yes, they both have um, room and board and, and our students typically stay on campus when they come for those experiences. Excellent. All right. That's it for now. <laughs> Thank Excellent. You. Very good. Um, Tabitha's question is how many courses are typically taken per term? Um, our program is set up for two courses per term in the MSN and the PGC programs. So that's about six to seven credit hours, and that is considered full time at the graduate level. Um, so on a rare occasion, somebody might take a third course, but that is an enormous workload. And um, really, I think it is only um, feasible for folks that don't have a lot of other responsibilities, such as working and children and or parents that you're caring for, et cetera, et cetera. So in general, we really strongly recommend two courses per term as a max. And then it is possible to cut back and do one per term on an occasional basis as well. Um, all right, Leah. What question do you have? Hi, sorry, I'm sitting outside. Hi. Um, I put Excellent. it in the chat. Hi, okay. my name's Leah. Um, I put it in the chat, but I know that you said um, that Frontier, and I've heard this from a few people that, have, that go to Frontier, that it's steeped in um, equity and all of that. So I'm just wondering on a institutional policy, um, tangible level, what that actually may look like. Um, does that well, make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So I was just taking a minute to kind of form an answer in my, or to, or to kind of solid, consolidate an answer in my head. You know, I think what that looks like for our students and um, is that, well, and for our students, staff and faculty is that I think diver those diversity, equity, inclusion principles really provide a foundation for everything that we do. We are uh, continuously trying to um, make sure really in every aspect of our community that we are using a lens of, of equity. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. We recently um, spent a, a really in kind of intensive period looking at our mission statement and making sure that from a, that our that we looked at our mission statement, our departmental philosophies and all of those Things that guide our work through a DEI lens. Um, that other another really small thing that comes to my mind is that when you go to and you look at the application, um, you actually are given a little. Um, there that is also a consideration that is taken because we are really trying to be intentional about um, having a nice diverse um, student body. Um, Anybody, Eva or anybody else, you want to add to that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I know I had asked for clarification a couple of times, Leah. I don't know if you saw, I was trying to uh, make sure that we spoke to exactly what it is that you're asking. Um, so uh, I just had thoughts too, and then they flew away. But we do have processes in place for how we handle um, instances that happen on campus that are mindful of the challenges that people have in living their life as human beings on the planet and in the US while they are attending school. Um, we don't presume to know what pronouns people use based on their names. Um, you will see people with different backgrounds and skin colors and ah, being attacked by an animal too, gender identities when you come to campus. Um, we have a DEI office that has three full-time staff in it. Um, and we definitely apply a DEI lens to the coursework and not just the coursework in terms of learning about the people that we care for, but in terms of how we think about what we expect students to do when they're in a course in terms of um, thinking about how we approach adult education about is it not putting due dates where they may not be necessary. Um, you know, understanding that people have lots of issues that go on in their life, but also um, using our own lived experience as educators and clinicians to guide people in the direction that we've learned is most appropriate to get you where your goals are taking you. Are there specific things that we haven't addressed yet that you're you're wondering about? I think it's a really big question. 
And I think I'm bringing it forward because I'm really sensitive to my experience and being safe in my experience. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I just finished my master's in nursing at Emory and that was, you know, it wasn't a great experience. And I just, I'm, yeah, to be transparent, Mm -hmm. I'm just feeling nervous about um, entering another institution and having to stifle my reality. Um, And I'm just wondering, because again, that was like a, a point that was made in the beginning. So I just wasn't sure if this organization or if this institution in particular was, um, you know, doing tangible things. And yeah. I don't, I, I, you know, on the top of my head, I don't have an idea of what tangible feels and tastes like, but mm-hmm. I wasn't sure if that was, um, you know, a principle that was acted on outside of the norm of what we call diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I so I don't have any, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think that's a really fair question. I appreciate your vulnerability. I see Stephanie wants to ask something also. Um, And I will just say, you know, in reality, Frontier is a historically white and continues to be a predominantly white institution. And I, you know, would be remiss to not state that that's the case. And I have worked in other institutions that are like, and now we have a DEI policy, but we definitely chew on this DEI policy and its implications on a daily basis. So it is not perfect. I cannot promise what anybody's actual experience will be day to day, but I can promise that those of us in leadership are invested in continuing to unpack everything that we can so that it is the most equitable possible place to work and learn. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Stephanie. Yeah, I would just like to echo that. And Leah, as an employee and a staff person, I can speak from that um, that side of things. In the 15 years that I've worked here, I would say in the last five years, we have rapidly changed um, everything from, I can't speak from the faculty side, but I know our curriculum, review of our curriculum. But on the staff side, there has been um, a lot of training and a lot of um, discussion from a student services point of view about safety and how to make our students um, feel included, safe, um, and how we as, you know, how we as staff people can do that for each other and also for our students. So it's been quite a learning process for a lot of our staff. They've never, a lot of our newer staff haven't been exposed to this type of training at other higher education institutions. So It's been quite a learning process for us, but we do understand the importance and uh, want to do the work and we will continue to do the work. Um, I sit on the president's DEI task force. I've done that for the past three years. And I can say this has been a huge effort for our institution to uh, recognize the past and try to help um, just move forward in a way that you know, reparations is a strong word, but at least to honor our students that are here now that are wanting to do this work for their communities and just to better healthcare uh, for underserved populations. And our president is committed to that and our faculty are committed to that. And I'm so proud when I talk to students that come to the campus that say that they do feel safe and that they do feel supported when they leave campus. So any, anytime you want to talk to any of us here at the institution, I know doc, any of the faculty will talk with you, um, whether it's one of us or someone else, to help just at least let you feel like you know what you're walking into. You know, I mean, that's as transparent as we can be. But thank you for the question being raised. Yeah, thank you. Like I said, I think I just have a, a heightened sense of sensitivity for my for my experience and know that like coming to Frontier, or doing CNM in general is like a deep, is a choice, is a deep choice in following a calling. So I just want to ask that question. So thank you guys for that, um, ladies. For sure. Thank you, people, for humans. Sure. Yeah, for that response. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Um, one thing I do want to make really transparent is that we don't um, approve exempt- medical or religious exemptions for the COVID vaccine. I just want to be really transparent about that. That's where we are right now. I don't know where we'll be with that in a year, but right now there isn't a way around that. And I I wanna be transparent about that because I don't want folks to spend um, time and effort and money applying if if that's gonna be an obstacle. And Because right now we cannot help you overcome that obstacle. Um, There's a great question about pass rates for midwifery certification. Our board exam pass rates are about 3% higher than the national average. They're right about 91%. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and that's a, that is, as I said, about 3% higher than the national average. Melanie, did you have one more question? Uh, yes, um, I, I will be applying for another year. I'm just kind of trying to get my ducks in a row, but as far as what I can do um, throughout the year, besides working as a nurse, um, are there things that I can do to be a more competitive applicant? Um, or are there things that stand out in the um, application process as far as like the essay that you, you guys particularly like? Bobby, do you wanna address that question? Sure. Um, I think the biggest thing, something that I tell people when I talk to them on the phone and we have these conversations about applying is to go and look at that um, example resume template on the on the website when you're looking at like the application um, materials, like what's required for the application, um, because that gives a really good idea of kind of some of the extra things you can do because they have on there, you know, have you um, given any like talks or speeches or, um, you know, your volunteer work, things like that. So I tell people like, just look at that example and it, you don't have to do everything on that list because there's a lot of stuff on that example resume, but just kind of look at that and see like, what are some things that you could do in your community um, from that list to, to make yourself stand out more um, as an applicant. As far as the essay, I don't, do any of like the um, admitting kind of process, but just kind of the little bits that, that I've heard um, from those that do review the applications with the essay, make it sound like you. Um, you know, everybody wants to get to know to know you um, when you're looking at that admissions criteria. And, you know, there's that GPA requirement, the experience requirement. Everybody kind of meets those, those different requirements. And that essay is kind of the chance to set you apart from other applicants and let them get to know you and, and kind of what you want to do in your community with this degree. Hopefully that helps. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah. Um, the acceptance rate for the CNM program, I don't know that I have that right off the top of my head. Um, it kind of varies from term to term. Um, I will say that summer tends to be the lowest number of applicants that we have and fall tends to be the highest. So if you're, so that actually impacts acceptance rates a little bit. Um, fall is more competitive to, for admission if I'm being really transparent with you. Um, so those are kind of some things to think about. And we, um, our time has really, we've really used up every single minute of our time plus a couple. So I just wanna say once again, thank you all for joining us tonight. And um, you can reach um, our admissions counselors. Their information to reach them is on the Frontier um, webpage. You're also very welcome to reach out to myself. I think I can say the same for Dr. Freed. Our email um, addresses are just our first name dot last name at frontier.edu. So for me, that's Eileen.thrower at frontier.edu. Admissions questions, I would direct, thank you for putting that in the chat box, um, Bobby, FNU admissions at frontier.edu. They're really the experts on all things related to admissions. So um, if you have more specific questions, though, about clinical concerns or any of our, our academic concerns, feel free to reach out to myself or Dr. Freed. And um, yes, the, re the, the session was recorded and that will be sent out to everyone that had registered for it. So um, we are really thankful that you are here tonight and hoping that we will see you all back again one day.